Uh, let's move to item 4.3, our state and federal update, Vice Chancellor Garcia. and also federal relations update and you have the reports there before you that you can read for further detail about the various bills moving through the process. I also wanted to just mention um, last week we did have the intersegmental um, advocacy day and for that event um, we were able to produce this document that or this um, brochure that you have at your desk. It's a really simple but nice um, brochure and I wanted to recognize uh, Vice Chancellor Paul Feast and his staff for the work that they did in helping us with that event. But um, this was a leave behind that was used for the advocacy day and really emphasizing um, job creation and economic recovery as the role of higher ed. So um, as you may know that right now we're in the middle, in the state legislative process, we're in the middle of the appropriations um, committee season. Um, the deadline for um, hearing appropriations bills is May 25th, so um, today, for example, the Senate Appropriations Committee was busily <coughs> meeting with a, a hearing legislation and will we'll have its final meeting next week and then they'll take up the suspense <coughs> file, which, is all, which are all the bills that have a significant fiscal impact that get put into the suspense file and then they're addressed um, um, as a whole <coughs> in terms of what will move forward. Um, so many of our bills that we've been uh, monitoring are um, in the Appropriations Committee or have just recently been passed. But as far as an update on our Board of Governors sponsored bills, we have SB 1456 and SB 1062, which are the two student success bills. They will be heard in appropriations next week. And um, they both got out of the Senate Education Committee without any no votes. And um, they're, 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 um, they have met with significant support in the Senate. Once they get through the Appropriations Committee and heard on the floor, and the, they would move to the Assembly, and then they would be heard in the Assembly Higher Education Committee probably sometime in June. Our other um, Board of Governors sponsored bills, um, SB 1402, which um, and SB 1070, the two economic development and um, career technical ed bills that you uh, discussed earlier this morning, are um, also in the Appropriations Committee and are up today in committee, and uh, will probably be put on the suspense file and then heard the final week uh, before the deadline, um, as all the suspense file measures are being reviewed. AB 2591 is another sponsored bill that, um, that is part of your package. And this is the bill that will say, like K-12, community colleges should have an automatic backfill for when property tax revenues come in short or when student fee revenues come in short. This bill is AB 2591 by Assembly Member Furatani. Um, the, the likelihood of passage this year is, is pretty um, dim. And um, it's right now in the S Assembly Appropriations Committee, but I think that it's been important to highlight just how challenging it is for us to get caught with that mid-year budget shortfall. And it has um, served a purpose in elevating this issue and helping folks understand how detrimental this is for the planning processes at our colleges. So um, we've gained a lot of empathy. Unfortunately, we haven't gained a lot of resources at this point, but that bill is out there as well. Those are your Board of Governors sponsored legislative bills, and we've talked about the details, so I don't need to go into any of that, but they are moving along well with the exception of the um, challenges for the uh, property tax backfill. But there are some definite themes in terms of other legislation that, that you should be aware of. College affordability is definitely, it's, it's an election year. Everyone's concerned about the rising costs of college and not just tuition, but book costs and living expenses. So not surprisingly, there are a lot of bills that have been introduced dealing with college affordability in either trying to contain um, college fees or especially trying to reduce the cost of textbooks. Those are two areas that try to get at making college more affordable 
for students. So a couple of the bills that um, have gotten a lot of attention lately are um, two bills or two companion measures, AB 1500 and AB 1501 by um, Speaker John Perez. And this is the Higher Education Middle Class Scholarship um, package of bills. And this, this bill would essentially establish or, or um, change the tax code to begin um, taxing multi-state businesses and require them to calculate their tax, their tax liability based on sales in California. This is referred to as the single factor formula, which you've probably heard about in the news media. This would generate about a billion dollars annually, and under um, Speaker John Perez's proposal, that billion dollars would be invested in a middle class scholarship program for higher education. The community college portion of this would be $150 million annually that would be distributed to colleges based on an FTE um, basis to um, either increase book grants or basically to determine what kind of affordability measures they can take at the local level to help students um, with the increase, increasing costs of colleges. The part of the measure that has gotten a lot of attention public in the newspapers is the part that would reduce UC and CSU fees by about two-thirds and basically anyone with a uh, annual income of $150,000 a year would be subject to this reduction in um, student fee costs. So that would, the bulk of the billion dollars would be invested in the UC and CSU um, fee reduction provisions. The bill, actually, um, this has been a priority for um, many of, our, of um, the Democratic legislators, and uh, there's a, been a strong push to gain support. It's a very popular concept to use um, new tax resources to help uh, struggling college families, and um, we're waiting to see how this bill progresses. It's now in the Assembly Appropriations Committee on Suspense. A couple of other bills, and this one's a newer bill. This one is um, SB 1466 and SB, um, oops, and SB 1356 by uh, Senator De Leon. This again is another package uh, of companion bills that's designed to try and help middle class families afford college. And this would establish a different tax um, program. It's called the Higher Education Investment Tax Credit Program Special Fund, and basically it would provide a 65% per of any contributions made to, um, uh, for charitable organizations to get a 65% tax credit on, organ on charitable gifts that are given to um, higher education. These funds would then be put into the to the Student Aid Commission for purposes of increasing the, the income threshold for Cal Grant students. So this, the one, one bill would establish the new tax credit, and the second bill would raise the, the income ceiling for Cal Grant recipients up to 150,000 a year. So there's clearly an effort afoot to try and convey to middle class families that the legislature is trying to make college more affordable. It is an election year, so um, these are very challenging bills, but, um, but they're popular and uh, they're winding their way through the process. So another set of bills that I'll just briefly touch on are textbook affordability bills and really looking at ways in which to increase um, e-textbooks or online educational resources that presumably would provide um, educational materials to students at a much lower cost. And Senator Pro Tem um, Daryl Steinberg has two bills, again two companion bills, that would establish one bill, 1052 would establish the California Open Educational Resources Council, and the second bill would establish the California Digital Open Source Library. So the idea behind his bill, the Resources Council would include faculty from all three segments who would basically determine which are the 50 top most popular courses that are textbooks that can be converted into online educational resources and offered to students at, a, at free or very low cost. 
Um, there are a lot of details involved in this type of proposal and the faculty, our academic senate, along with the other um, UC and CSU academic senates, as along with um, our vice chancellor for academic affairs here in the chancellor's office, are working closely with um, Senator Steinberg to try to flesh out what those details are to actually make a program like this work. And then the library would be an, uh, the online library where you, you would house all these textbooks, um, the online textbooks, and students would have access to these, um, these um, course materials. Now, of course, there's a price tag associated with this, and it's prohibitively expensive. Uh, Senator um, Steinberg has says he's going to look to the private sector for um, support in funding this, but at right now it's um, about 25 to 30 million dollars to try to um, approve this set of bills. And there are other textbook bills, you can read about them in your state legislative update, but they're, they're basically bills that will try, that provide consumer information so students and faculty can make more informed choices about books to purchase and, and books to assign to students. So there continues to be a strong push in that area and our office is working closely with them. Um, Vice Chancellor Linda Michalowski and um, Vice Chancellor Barry Russell are both um, heavily involved in these efforts to try and provide information. Another set of bills are um, veterans bills and there have been a significant number of veterans bills introduced this year, about seven of them. Only about four of them are moving, and um, you have those outlined in your report, but basically um, what they attempt to do are provide um, <coughs> in-state tuition for uh, veterans who are, are discharged from the military and um, would like to have in-state tuition for the first year, not have to wait a whole year. There are bills to try and pr extend this this um, um, benefit to dependents of veterans. And there's also a bill, AB 2462, by Assemblymember Block that would tr attempt to provide academic credit for prior military service. Um, these are all bills that are trying to help veterans move quickly into the workforce by acknowledging the skills and expertise they developed while in the military and also making college as affordable as possible to them as they transition back into civilian life. So there are a lot of bills in that category. Let me just touch on a couple of other bills that are um, important to note. Um, Assembly Bill 1741 introduced by um, Assembly Member Fong is a bill that um, was sponsored by faculty, the uh, FAC organization to establish the Student Success Infrastructure Fund. I think that there have been some significant differences of opinion on how that would complement um, SB 1456, um, uh, Senator Lowenthal's Student Success Act of um, 2012 and your sponsored bill. But I think that this bill has moved us in a direction where we're beginning to have some conversations about how to recognize that there are, <coughs> the whole institution is involved in student success, but that for SB 1456 is focused on those specific student support services um, to help them initially get started on the right foot, but that there is a clear need to acknowledge the entire system and the role we all play in um, helping students progress. So those conversations will be taking place in the next several weeks. SB 1550 by Senator Wright is a bill that um, establishes a pilot project to provide ex extension courses to students um, for credit only during the summer and focused on uh, career technical education classes. This bill specifically makes it clear that colleges are not able to utilize um, two-tier pricing uh, for outside of this pilot project and it's an explicit attempt to clarify that the proposal from Santa Monica Community College would not be permissible under this legislation. So this legislation is also an appropriations and um, I'm not clear what its fate is at this point. Um, there's also another bill, AB 2275, which I got some questions about by um, Assembly Member Akajian. And this is a bill that deals with the STRS issue where um, a current waiver to the existing STRS requirement that a retired annuitant can only earn 
um, 31,000 a year, and that's been waived, and that's been utilized by many in the community college system to hire retired annuitants, particularly to serve in interim presidency roles as um, various colleges are struggling during these difficult times and to bring in individuals who have expertise in managing colleges. Um, the bill is actually not moving, but um, Vice Chancellor Dan Troy and Executive Vice Chancellor Eric Skinner um, and I have been talking with committee staff and there are discussions underway to see if this is an issue that can be addressed within the budget um, trailer bill context. So it's something we're watching carefully and we'll keep you apprised as, <coughs> as these discussions move forward. I think that about summarizes the state report. Unless you have any questions, um, I'm happy to answer or move on to the federal report. I, oh, just one quick question. Uh, in my district, we uh, voted to endorse the, the, the legislation sponsored by the, um, the system. But one of the issues that came up with Senator Liu's bill was that uh, there was some uh, opposition within the civil service ranks about the, um, uh, and I, I, I was puzzled by that uh, because the, uh, uh, the appointment of the vice chancellors aren't subject currently to civil service provisions, I believe, right. and, uh, and therefore the new bill would, would, would just empower the chancellor to make those appointments more readily, subject to the Board of Governors approval, I, I assume. And, um, and so I was puzzled by the, the, uh, the possible opposition based on civil service uh, um, grounds. Currently, there are two ways in which um, senior staff, vice chancellors, as part of the chancellor's cabinet can be appointed. One is through the exempt process, and that's through a gubernatorial appointment. And the other is through the CEA process, the career executive assignment process. And that is a civil service um, position. We currently have our vice chancellors basically have come in through both uh, pathways, and the legislation only says for purposes of the CEA pathway, which the chancellor makes that direct appointment. It, does, it isn't subject to a gubernatorial appointment, and it can be expedited uh, when we need to fill a vacancy on the, on the cabinet. Um, what the legislation says is that currently you either have to, to be qualified to come in through that route, you have to be a civil servant, or you have to have worked in the legislature or the executive branch for two years. The legislation expands that and says, or you, you, can, if you must have served at least five years at a community college, another higher education institution, or come from the workforce and economic development um, sector. So it expands that, that uh, pathway and the options for drawing um, community college specific um, talent from the field into the chancellor's office. <coughs> it, wouldn't have, it wouldn't take any specific positions out of no. their eligibility for civil service no. uh, uh, appointment too. Okay. And it wouldn't shut out civil servants from applying for these positions. Right. Now, on, and on 2275 you mentioned, and I'd, I'd raise that issue, um, if the, the bill does not pass that extends the waiver, does everybody who may be collecting a STRS uh, uh, retirement allowance then go b back from where they are down to the one uh, to the 31,000 that's what I understand but I'd like to defer to my colleague um, vice Ch executive vice chancellor Eric Skinner who's been or Dan uh, vice chancellor Dan Troy who've been more directly involved but that's my understanding so, so a retiree in the system if they're, er they're they're being paid as an acting or even as an employee, and then they, um, would, their, would, their, would their retirement collection bill be reduced as a result of the ending of this waiver? That's, that's correct. So what the, you know, there's a whole host of exemptions that have been in play for some time, and, and there's a, uh, a push that's really coming out of STRS um, to shut down those exemptions. So going forward, if STRS has its way and, and uh, these, uh, the $31,000 a year for STRS retirees would be the, the exemption limit. And then above that, it would cut into the, any retirement um, benefits the, the individual um, received. And so STRS has essentially said that, that, that that's a reasonable um, threshold. 
or if individuals would like to come back and work, they can always be reinstated. And so that's, they've been taking a tough line on a, this, and it's really been playing out through a conference committee that's um, been meeting uh, in the legislature, and that conference committee is likely to come forward with a report that will most likely find, try to find some middle ground between what the position stirs is staked out and the position that, you know, other stakeholders would want that would to to continue the exemption. So uh, it, it's one of those things we're having to, to, to wait and see. That the particular issue that we're, is most of concern to us is that special trustees, the individuals that that uh, the chancellor and the board assigned to districts that are in distress, um, those positions historically we've been able to use the exemptions in order to to find really seasoned you know, experienced administrators who have served in tough situations and made tough, tough, you know, tough decisions. Um, it, it's allowed us to, to uh, hire from those ranks, bring those individuals into these, um, usually what are very short-term assignments, but, but critically important and sensitive assignments in districts that are in distress. And so if we lose that ability, uh, it would be a, a, a hardship and we'd be concerned we wouldn't be able to get the right talent to go into those Situation. So that's the, pr <coughs> the primary issue that we're tracking. Thank you. Um, Vice Chancellor, why don't you move on to your federal uh, report? Okay. This will be brief. Um, Congress, right now, um, the Senate and the House of Representatives are um, grappling with their budget um, challenges. Um, as you may have read in the papers, um, the House of Representatives passed their uh, fiscal year 2013 budget resolution known as the Ryan, the Ryan um, budget. And that budget is particularly problematic for community colleges. It includes significant cuts to Pell Grants, uh, reducing eligibility uh, requirements. For example, one particular uh, provision in the Ryan um, budget would eliminate uh, Pell Grant eligibility for less than half-time students, which in California that would be a major, major loss for our students. Um, the Senate, on the other hand, has a very different um, framework. As a matter of fact, in Congress, you don't have to <coughs> respond to the President's budget um, proposal as you do at the state level. So what they've done instead, they um, passed a measure that allows them to use the um, budget Control Act of last year as their budget framework, and they then have parceled that out to the 12 appropriations <coughs> committees that are working on the budget appropriations. And their, um, their budget proposal is much more favorable to higher education and community colleges, and essentially includes many of the President's proposals for community colleges, which clearly are um, much more attractive for us, especially in the area of economic development and career technical ed as well. Um, the good news is for, with regard to Pell Grants is there isn't a shortage um, for Pell Grant funding this year, so there's a little less pressure in Congress to have to take some of these very harsh draconian actions this year. Next year it's not clear what the situation will be, but because it's an election year and because the situation with Pell Grant funding is not um, as challenging as it has been in the past, there may be a little pressure release to have to take some of these, um, these harsh actions this year. They're probably not going to approve a budget before uh, September 30th, the end of the fiscal year, and it's very likely that you're going to see the continuing resolution process to carry through until November elections. And then after that, you may see some action um, in terms of the budget um, resolution. Um, as far as the difference between the Senate um, budget discussions and the House budget discussions, it's about $19 billion gap. So it is significant, and, um, and, and, and those discussions will play out for the rest of the year. Now, I will point out one issue that is moving, and there is some agreement that um, it needs to be addressed, and that is the, the, the student Stafford loan um, interest rate that currently is 3.4%, and it would double by July 1st to 6% um, plus. Um, well, both the Democrats and the Republicans agree that it shouldn't double, they can't agree on how to cover the cost, which is about a, 16, a $6 billion cost to retain that um, lower interest rate for the next year. The Republicans want to tax the um, 
or rather want to reduce the, um, the, um, the president's um, health care proposal, one of the provisions within that health care proposal, and the, um, and the Democrats would like to instead establish an S corporation tax that would generate the resources needed to cover those costs. So between now and July 1st, uh, they must take action on this issue. They're probably going to, as you've been reading, it's a very, again, another very popular issue. It's ironically not the most critical issue for community colleges since loans are not what we're, um, we advocate most, and instead we'd rather the funds go into Pell Grant, but it is a significant issue. And in the middle of those discussions, the um, American Association of Community Colleges has tried to put the, um, the ability to benefit issue back on the table, and that was the action that the Congress took last fall to eliminate all Pell Grant funding for students who don't have the high school diploma or, um, or have only a G, uh, GED. So that's actually still in play. It's still a long shot, but it's kind of hovering in the background, and there has been some receptivity to how um, difficult that action was for community college students. So we'll keep posted, um, and um, it's likely that the only real action affecting community colleges or higher ed is going to be that um, the student loan interest issue. And we have reauthorization discussions are continuing on. There's a couple of competing measures from the Democrats and the Republicans. That's not likely to be addressed before the election year. But the legislation is probably going to frame the discussion for the future. And um, you know, if they take that up next year, um, part of the legislation will be what the issues are. And a lot of the issues are whether to consolidate a lot of these workforce investment programs into fewer numbers of programs. So we'll keep watching that. Um, but that that I think covers the federal report. I'm happy to answer any questions. We have uh, several members uh, of the public who wish to address the board uh, for this and the next item. And I just remind all speakers that they are limited to three minutes each. Uh, Jonathan Lightman from uh, Faculty Association. Thank you, um, President Himmelstein and Chancellor Scott and members. I'm Jonathan Lightman on behalf of the Faculty Association of California Community Colleges. And um, yeah, I do want to compliment the Vice Chancellor and all of her staff. This is a, um, you know, it's a time of year where all the amendments are going fast and furious. And just to stay on top, uh, just even, you know, getting ahead of all these amendments is very complicated. You know that she does a very good job for you. Um, I'm, I'm here to discuss AB 1741, which, uh, as uh, Vice Chancellor Garcia mentioned, is sponsored by FAC. And you do have an opposed position. We do acknowledge that. Um, let me share with you what the bill does and, and what our intent is. Um, in the discussion of student success, uh, faculty raised uh, no fewer than seven times, probably closer to ten, the idea that it, we do need to support our students with counselors, with support <coughs> services, with instructional faculty, including full-time faculty, and a professionalized part-time faculty beginning with office hours. So we borrowed the language from 1456 that said all of this would be subject to the Budget Act, and we never said in the bill that items in 1456 couldn't be accomplished unless everything was fully funded. In fact, we have the Legislative Council drafted that is willing to affirm that. And that's essentially how the bill was presented to the Assembly Higher Education Committee. It was approved with all the Democrats. And their message was that, that there's a lot of merit in what we want to do insofar as it's consistent, in fact, with your longstanding policies. I went through your budget change proposal, which you approved unanimously, and I found the word restore or restoration, particularly as it pertained to student services, 23 times. That's your policy. Full-time faculty is your policy. Counselors is your policy. Part-time faculty is your policy. We're not opposed to any innovative ideas, but we don't want to substitute them for what's proven. And in fact, as uh, Vice Chancellor Russell said in his report many times at the Academic Senate, was so central to your conversations about teaching and learning, they approved this bill on their consent calendar, meaning there wasn't any opposition. It's something to take note of. The good thing is, is that at both the hearing on 1741 and 1456, 
legislators felt that we were all moving in a very positive direction, that there is continuing dialogue. And I think that the Vice Chancellor mentioned that to you. We're committed to that. And uh, we want to see all, all these discussions result in something of a consensus fashion. And, and we're certainly willing to discuss that. Our hope is, is that at the end of the day, next year and the year after, when we know we're going to have a new Chancellor, we'll have a whole series of new players, 50% turnover in the State Assembly that we're going to celebrate what we did this year and we're going to do it with all parties on board. Thank you. Judith Michaels, CFT. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Th I'm Judith Michaels of legislation. I do legislation for the Federation of Teachers. And I just want to say that the CFT certainly does support the efforts to work on the infrastructure that would make uh, SB 1456 realizable. Um, I started my career as a librarian, and that's a service that's often overlooked as we, um, as we concentrate on the 50% law and that sort of thing. So I do urge you to take a second look at that, um, at that legislation. I did want to say that um, I appreciate the very thorough report given by Vice Chancellor Garcia, and it illustrates for you, I think, in a way that, that um, the colleges out there are suffering. They are dealing with all sorts of nibbling around the edges um, when it comes to student fees, how Board of Governor waivers are um, realized extension courses, should we have them? If so, how many? And the CFT does remain opposed to that program. And the books, textbooks, e-books, scholarships. But one of the most important um, issues before you in the next couple of weeks is the backfill issue. Because some of you do have contacts with um, Governor Brown. And to emphasize to him, we don't care whether that com where that money comes from in a state budget, even though a, a badly reduced state budget, I think it's about $84 billion now, uh, there's got to be $100 million in there to help our colleges get through this year. Thank you. Dennis Fridge, Faculty Association. Dennis. Dennis Frisch, President of the Faculty Association California Community Colleges. Uh, I wanted to present you with a brief comment on just one of the bills that uh, Vice Chancellor Garcia reported to you. Uh, that's uh, SB 550. Uh, that is the uh, bill that would uh, authorize a pilot program for the summer in offering con uh, career technical education courses at cost. Uh, and uh, FAC, uh, would urge you to oppose this bill because we think that while we recognize the, the financial uh, situation that colleges find themselves in now, this is a bill which is very much like AB 515, which appeared last year and which would authorize colleges to offer courses at cost. Our belief is that this is something which has many negative downsides. Uh, first of all, career technical education courses are usually, if not the most expensive, some of the most expensive courses uh, to offer at a community college. Uh, and if these courses, even in a limited summer program that is envisioned in this bill, uh, were to be offered, it is uh, probably more exclusionary than inclusive. Uh, in the sense that many of the students who come to these career technical education courses come from uh, economically disadvantaged uh, conditions uh, and perhaps often need uh, more time uh, to prepare themselves. Uh, this would certainly not encourage them uh, to sign up for these courses. It also, I think, is a very fundamental challenge uh, to the foundations on which uh, the master plan for education and community colleges were established, uh, which intended to make higher education available to all who wanted it, uh, irrespective of their financial and, and, and socioeconomic conditions. Uh, this bill would open the door 
uh, to a substantial uh, reversal of those kinds of, of fundamental commitments. And because of those things, we urge you to oppose this bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chancellor Scott would like to uh, say something, and then when we're going to take a 10-minute break. Uh, well, first, uh, I appreciate what uh, Dennis Frisch just said. Uh, I didn't update you exactly on the Santa Monica situation, <coughs> as you know. Uh, our office had opined that uh, that was not legal uh, to offer a two-tier system. The Santa Monica Board of Trustees disagreed with us and therefore chose to go ahead with the program. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, we had a rather difficult situation of facing them in a board meeting. And uh, if you recall, the newspaper simply reported uh, that I, in turn, called him and suggested uh, to the president that they uh, put that on hold. Uh, we are, we had received uh, a, not, a, not a written opinion, but we had indicated that the attorney general had indicated some hesitancy as well about this whole matter. Uh, so uh, uh, we have, uh, all, you know, we, we, have, we want to work with Santa Monica, and as you well know, uh, this office is not hierarchical in nature. Uh, I do not give orders to the local <coughs> boards of trustees. Uh, they are uh, the ones who determine colleges, but we did indicate that we did not feel that the code permitted uh, the kind of two-tier system. Now, obviously, if this bill uh, passes, I believe it, did you say 550? Was that the name? 1550. Uh, what? 1550. 1550. Well, if that bill passes, then it would make it legal. And uh, that's a different matter under a certain uh, pilot obligation. One in interesting thing in the bill is it specifically says uh, that before uh, that a college could offer these CTE courses at that high uh, cost, that they would have to get rid of all avocational courses. Uh, so uh, there are some safeguards in that, and I believe it's limited to five colleges, but we shall see what shall happen about that. Uh, uh, and uh, just a brief comment about uh, that uh, uh, Jonathan Lightman commented about AB 1741. Uh, we did uh, raise some concerns about that bill. Uh, for one thing, about the process, uh, there had been no introduction of that bill before it came uh, to the legislature before the consultation council uh, been no discussion of the bill in fact the bill was presented to uh, senator lowenthal as an amendment and he chose not to add it to his bill and so there was then it was then taken uh, over to the assembly and introduced as a new bill now i want to clearly understood that all along the the student success task force was quite in favor of the increasing of counselors, quite in, in favor of the increasing of full-time faculty, uh, and all these things, but uh, the likelihood of that suddenly happening before we could institute any reforms was quite unlikely because if we were to restore all categoricals and all the other things, that would be a billion-dollar bill. Um, so uh, the only thing that we would hesitate about the bill is that if it's said in effect, you have to do all these things before you can do any reforming. Uh, I would have liked, for instance, for that bill to come out for such things as common assessment, orientation, uh, the fact that we should uh, have a student success scorecard. Uh, are these things that uh, we're not all in favor of? And uh, some way or another, it said that they oppose uh, 1456 unless it's amended. Uh, I'm not quite sure what those amendments are, because it appears to me that the student success uh, recommendations, whether it's enrollment priority or all these other things, seems to contain things that a lot of the, uh, at least the student success task force wanted. And by the way, it was not without faculty uh, representation, if you recall. Jane Patton, the president of the Academic Senate, had appointed four members uh, to that uh, particular uh, task force. And, and then Manuel Baca, the faculty representative here on the Board of Governors, was appointed by the Board of Governors. So 
I'll just simply uh, state those things in terms of, of uh, exactly what has happened. Uh, I'm very hopeful that uh, 1456 will continue on its way, and uh, certainly on one or two items, I know that uh, Senator Lowenthal was very open. Uh, we thought, in terms of the bog fee waiver, that maybe after someone had had it for 110 units, that we not, might not ought to renew that. But there was opposition that came uh, by some members of the uh, community college uh, group, and so we simply removed that. So we've, I think Senator Lowenthal has been very open to listening uh, to those who have had concerns about it. And uh, if there remains something about the bill uh, that is objectionable, other than the fact that somebody wants to say that we have to spend all the money on many other things before we can do anything, I'm sure we'll continue to be open to it. Thank you. We have one uh, more member of the public uh, wishing to uh, address the board, uh, Ruth Weldon. Wellen. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, uh, Board of Governors and Chancellor Scott. I, um, I had the opportunity to meet you, um, Chancellor Scott, at the All California Academic Team, and I wanted to thank you for that uh, speech, which I'm still digesting. Um, I, I'm here today because um, as an as a honor student, and as a, all, a member of the All California Academic Team, um, and as a nominee for the All USA Coca-Cola Scholarship, I have so much potential to um, excel academically. Um, I had the opportunity to advance uh, last semester to the, to the, to the uh, final rounds, but uh, mid-semester, uh, last semester, mid at midway, my tutor had to resign due to a lack of funding, um, which left me scrambling to find support for intermediate algebra. And up, leading up to this semester, I had gotten straight A's in my in my math courses. Um, needless to say, I p barely passed the class. Um, not because I wasn't capable of succeeding, but because there was a lack of support in the classroom. And um, that knocked me out of, that knocked my chances down for reaching the final rounds at the national level, uh, naturally to my disappointment. But I'm here because um, I, I, I want you guys to understand how important uh, it is for me and students just like me with disabilities who want to succeed, who have the potential to succeed, who I, I am so eager to learn and I aspire one day to advocate uh, on a legislative level for students with disabilities but because there's a lack of support in the classroom, because there's a lack of uh, adequate technology, because there's a lack of staff support um, for counseling, um, it's been a challenge. And I'm asking the committee to please consider very strongly rejecting the governor's proposal to put our funding into a block grant and to allow myself and students just like me the potential to exceed, to excel, and also to become taxpaying citizens. Because I know that one day, if I'm given this opportunity to, to shine in the classroom, I will be an asset to the state of California and to this country. And I ask you to please consider rejecting the uh, governor's proposal unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, members, we're going to take a 10-minute break. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Garcia.